To go here through step one, step one is the choice for the location of the plastic entry, where you would you like to put the RBS. And you guys, you understand that the location of this RBS is to be able to control the plastic hinge. And actually, this is going to be controlling the distance from a hinge to a hinge. This is going to be very critical. The three parameters that you need to pick is going to be A, B, and C. And they need to be good numbers. You don't see um, like a like, uh, very small fraction when it comes to the choice of A, B, and C. Radius is going to be whatever it's going to be. It's going to be any number that you can just calc out. So when you choose A, B, and C, A is going to be the distance from the face of the column, flange of the column to the beginning of the RBS. B is going to be the length of the RBS itself. And C is going to be the cut from the flange. I'm going to say here both sides. So each one is going to be C. And also top and bottom, each one of them is going to be C. This choice, it needs to be within this range. When it says here B is going to be the flange width for the beam, it says B. BF. So this B here stands for beam. And this B is going to stand for the width of the flange. And you see, everything here is going to be related to the beam itself, nothing to the column, because this RBS is going to be cut through the beam of the moon train. So you have a range, you pick good numbers. Then you have this SH, which we have here two definitions for it. At the beginning, SH is going to be location of the center of the plastic hinge from the center of the column. Later on, they're going to use SH to be the distance from the face of the column to this plastic hinge location. So I'm going to say first, this SH or S sub H is going to be equal to B divided by 2 plus A plus 1 half of the column depth. And we have it right there. After you make your choice here, you need to figure out the mechanism shear. And this mechanism shear is gonna be very similar to that mechanism force that you're talking about when it comes to plastic and of moon frames. This mechanism shear, if you wanna figure it out, you need to find out the distance from the center of the plastic inch to plastic inch. If L sub zero here is gonna be the distance from the center of the column to center of the column, L prime is going to be distance from central plastic hinge to central plastic hinge. As it says here, L prime is going to be equal to L sub zero from here to there, subtracting two times S sub H. Remember, this S sub H is going to be to the center of the column. So this here, the center of the column. I'm going to have also this Z sub E. This is going to be a new variable. We have ZX, and DX is going to be for the beam itself. So ZX is going to be for the entire cross section area of the beam before you do the cut in the flanges. This ZE is going to be reduced value from the ZXB, which is for the main original beam that we just talked about. Then you say subtracting, and then you have this term here, and this ZE is going to be the Z of the RBS. So now I have two Z values. I have one Z value for the main beam, we call this ZXB and then ZRBS, which is going to be for this reduced section. And to do the analysis, I have this two times the C, the cut, thickness of the beam flange, depth of the beam, thickness of the flange of the beam. And with that, you get the Z of the RBS. Step number three here, you need to find out the probable moment, which is the maximum moment that you can ever develop at this plastic engine. This includes ZE, which is Z of the RBS, applied by F sub Y, and then you have two factors. The first one accounts for the specified value versus the test values, or the actual value for the yield strength. And usually this gives be 1.1 for the A992 steam. CPR is going to account for this, if I may here show quick, just find out here. So first, the yield point here, the test versus the specified, you're going to have a difference of, let's say, within 10%. Because of the strain hardening, 
the steel is going to start to pick up here once you get to this amount of strain the steel is going to be show some resistance since we don't know exactly at what at which limit that we're going to be pushing this steel mount frame to we're going to have this factor that's going to be called cpr to account for this increase so i'm going to see here if y if y is specified and then because you may be going through this curve here for the strain hardening we're going to be including a new factor that we call here CPR. This CPR is going to be equal to the average between, as you see here, F sub U divided by F sub Y, right? Multiply, excuse me, F sub U plus F sub Y divided by two, and then you divide this by F sub Y. It's going to give you a ratio here to increase the trends of the beam. We have Wu Park with us, right there. Yes, you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, very good, all right. So this is actually gonna be the maximum moment that you can ever develop at the plastic end. Mechanism shear is gonna be equal to two, is gonna be two times NPR because you have the same moment on each side. divided by this L prime, which is a distance from central plastic into central plastic entry, and we have it right there. Let's give you the mechanism here, we call V probable, it's gonna be VPR, two times NPR divided by L prime. Again, let me go here to this picture, which is more comprehensive, it's gonna be two times NPR divided by this, the distance from the center of the plastic entry to central plastic entry. Now, the final shear here, in order for you to find out the demand at the RBS, you need to include maybe some of this gravity loading. Gravity loading means dead load and life load. In this case, uh, you need to add 0.5 as a load factor and 1.2 for the load factor for the dead load. So this gives you the load factors that you need to use. The code here is very clear. The shear demand that you have at the RBS is going to be equal to 1.2 V dead load. So in this case, you're going to be taking here L prime applied by W dead load divided by two. Then you take 50% of V life load. This V life load is going to be W life load applied by L prime divided by two. You take one side here, one half here, plus the mechanism shear, which is calculated like what we discussed. This is going to be the shear demand. And this is going to be step number four. Now, one side, the shear demand is going to be added because look at this view of the RBS, right? Look at this VPR. At one side, it's going to be added, the other side is going to be subtracted. This is why you're going to end up with two different shears, right? But absolutely, we're going to be using this one, which is VPRBS, right? And this one usually is called VRBS prime. We're going to be using this to check the shear in RB. Now we need to check and confirm that the plastic hinge is really happening here. Now, how do you confirm this? You need to be sure that when the plastic hinge happens at this location, that this section here is still in the elastic range. How do you confirm this? If you take this mechanism shear that happens right here at this location, when this gabby started to hinge, right? You take the shear here, applied by this distance to the face of the column. Add any other gravity moment that you'd like to add to this, as if this is like a cantilever section coming from this fixed support. And then you check here again is the elastic, the plastic moment of this beam section. And you need to be sure it's gonna be less than one. So is that you confirm that the plastic hinge is happening here while this section of the beam is still in the um, elastic range. Now, if you see here now, this gave be new definition for SH. Now it's gonna be taken to the face of support. You take this M at the face of support, it's gonna be equal to MPR, which is a moment developed here, plus V at the RBS, which we just calculated out here. This is gonna be VRPS, applied by this SH. After you do this, 
You can add a little bit of gravity moment or you can ignore it if, and look at this, if the gravity moment is given within half percent of the M at phase that you just calculated out. In a case like that, you can just ignore it. Most likely you're gonna ignore it because the moment value that you're talking here about, when you compare it to the demand coming from the gravity, I mean, it's gonna be really like, like it's gonna be substantial. So you can simply, you can ignore the gravity load if you want to. Okay. Now this gave you the demand. So M sub F is giving you your demand that you apply at this beam that you like to keep in the elastic range. Now you look at this MPE. This MPE, which is the capacity in this case, I'm gonna call it to be the capacity. If this gave you demand, MF, this M sub P is giving you your capacity. It's gonna be equal to ZXB. Now it's gonna be for the main beam, not for the RBS. You multiply this by F sub y, yield strength. And then you increase it by R sub y, which is usually is gave you 1.1 for the type of steel we use. You'll notice here that CPR is not included. When you see here, when we're doing here the our moment, the maximum moment that you can ever develop, we have this CPR, which is give you roughly, let's say 1.15, maximum 1.2. But in here, we don't include it because we want to be sure that this beam is really, the rest of the beam is going to be really in the elastic range. And that was um, step number six. Now you compare MF to this phi MPE. How about the phi factor? Someone's going to say, do we have a phi factor here? Yes, and the phi factor is going to be equal to one. So in this case here, you need to be sure that when you take demand to capacity, is going to be less than 1.0. A good value is going to be 0.9. You try usually to keep it like 0.9. 0.93 is going to be okay. If you find it to be 0.8, you know that, I mean, your choice of the cut was, was not the right choice. You'd like to keep it very close to 0.9. Now, what happens if you are not able to make it? So what is wrong? And we discussed this also. I mentioned this before. It means the amount of moment here that you develop at the face of support, just big. Because either this MPR is really big and you need to reduce it by maybe making a bigger cut. Or maybe you'd like to bring this plastic hinge, you'd like to bring it to the left a little bit, which means that you'd like here to reduce B and A. Why is that? Because when you reduce A and B, L prime is gonna increase and the mechanism shear is gonna reduce. Let me go back here just to confirm it. What happened when this L prime goes up, when you increase L prime, look at what happened to the, the shear, the shear demand. L prime is gonna be going up, V PR, which is a mechanism shear is gonna be reduced. And once it's gonna reduce, look at this, what happened when it goes down, V PR, look at this. M sub F is gonna also get reduced. And once this MF is going to get reduced, you're going to be keeping this section of the beam to be in the elastic range of performance. I said, great. So what's next? Now we'd like to see here if our beam is going to be able to take the shear demand. Yeah, this can be the same shear demand that we just calculated out, which is this VRBS. And again, if you'd like to add a little bit of gravity shear, this is going to be okay. If you like to ignore them, this is going to be also okay but not this V gravity. This V gravity at the RBS is gonna be maybe good amount of shear that you're gonna be looking at. So this V sub U is gonna be equal to the V gravity, which is coming from the long beam. But V gravity coming from the short cantilever here, which is a sub edge. This one you can ignore from this piece here. So in this case, if you like to check V at the RBS, you can use this value, which includes the gravity coming from the L prime not from the sub edge. Now, if you wanna check the shear, I guess we have seen this before. In gravity beam design, just this factor was a little bit different. And this is to confirm the stability of the web, of the beam web. And to confirm that's gonna be kind of compact within certain parameters. So if the depth of the beam divided by the web thickness of the beam is gonna be within this range, 
then this is fine. You can take C sub V is gonna be equal to 1.0 and your VN as usual is gonna be 0. 0.6 times F sub Y is gonna be the yield strength that you'd like to use, that you'd like to use here for any structure steel member. Area of the web is gonna be depth of the web multiplied by the web thickness. C sub V again is gonna be equal to 1.0. Now we need to look at the beam to column connection. Now I'd like here to look at one connection so that you are clear. I'm talking about here the shear tab. How can we connect it to this beam? Let me look here for quick for some detail for it. And go back here to one of the slides that shows the detail. Okay, here we go. Look what happened here. Usually, the plate, this plate, the connection of the plate, the shear plate to the beam is going to be full pin weld. If you have here full pin weld, the strength of the full pin weld is going to be stronger than the plate itself. So what you need to do is take this V design that you're going to be using and you just do full pin weld between the plate to the comp. So now this connection here between the plate to the column is guaranteed. After that, you design this bolt to be single shear. So it's gonna be all in single shear. Now let me move forward to this shear design for the connection. It says here, because of the beam to web connection is made with a complete joint penetration, this is gonna be the full penetration. You're not gonna have here any problem because the shear tab also is gonna be designed for the shear. Now you should be able to use bolts between the shear tab and between the steel beam is going to be a single plate shear connection, meaning that now we need to design the bolts for that shear domain. Now, again, when we come to the connection between the plate and between the column, we're going to do here full pin one. If you remember in the previous connection design, we didn't really do full pin. We just do fill it well from both sides. So in this case, it's going to be fully pin penetration or full penetration between the web or the shear plate to the column. Now, in step number 10 here, you'd like to see the continuity plate. And what is a continuity plate? Like what we discussed in the plan view, it's gave you this plate, it's gave you through the column, it's gonna be kind of a stiffener plates. Now, when you're gonna have your tension on the top of this beam, it's gonna be going through the plane of the beam. This tension force is going to be distributed throughout the width of the beam flange. It's going to be pulling this column flange out in this direction. And this is going to be our concern. We don't want to damage here the column flange. We want it to keep in the S range. So what can we do? If the thickness here of this column flange is kind of a smaller than certain value, we need to start to put this continuity plate in both lines to be able to take the force from the beam flange to the column flange through this continuity plate and then transfer it to the column web. As we know that any shear is gonna be taken by the web of the structure member. So if I have here any tension, it's gonna be coming like this, right? And of course, gonna be distributed between this point to that point, right? So eventually this force is gonna get transferred to this web. And we want to be sure when we transfer this force from the flange of the steel beam to the web of the steel column, we want to be sure that this flange of the column is not damaged or bent. Again, how do we do this? We provide continuity plates in both lines. Now, if the column flange, look at this, this gave you the column flange thickness, which is this thickness here. If this column flange thickness, is going to be within this criteria, is going to be larger than this value, these two terms or these two equations. In this case, you don't really need it. You don't need the continuity plate. But if the required thickness here, right, is going to be larger than the actual column flange thickness that you provided, it means that you need to have this continuity plate. Just so you guys know, in practice, we usually put them. No matter what, we'd like to keep them there. It's a good, good practice to keep them there, to put the continuity plate. So I said, okay, I'm gonna put this continuity plates and I have here two cross-section areas that I need to use in my analysis. 
Number one is gonna be this section. If you look here, this is gonna be called area of PB. What is this area of PB? It's gonna be equal to this length, D of the continuity plate, applied by the thickness of it. And the other ones gonna be for the width. Look at this here. It's gonna be this area here, APW. What's APW? It's gonna be equal to this length, multiplied by the thickness of the beam. We have here the equations for it. APB is gonna be the width, multiplied by the T of the continuity plate. And then we have also this area of PB again, which is the same here. Again, it's gonna be WPB. What is WPB? It seems gonna be kind of shifted because this point here should be pointing from here to there. If you see here what I'm talking about, it should be this distance from here to there, right? It's gonna be the distance kind of shifted in the PDF. And the power point is not shifted. I don't know what's going on. The other cross-section area that we're talking about is gonna be APW. It's gonna be the thickness of continuity plate multiplied by this length. And what is this length here? If I may look at it, look at this. Continuity plate multiplied by DC minus two times TCF. I'm gonna say, okay, this is gonna be APW, which is this section here. It's gonna be equal to this length, which means it's W multiplied by, if you look here, multiplied by the thickness of the plate. Now, you'd like here to do the design for the continuity plate. So you have a few forces acting based on the capacity of it, capacity of certain items. In order for you to do this design for the welded connection, you need to look at the lowest force acting on that section. And all of these forces is kind of mechanism forces, which means it's gonna be based on the actual capacity of the section. So when you look here at this strength, this is strength called APB, which means the tension strength of this continuity plate. You see here F sub Y times APB times V. So what does it mean by that? It means the maximum tension force that you can develop here in this phase of the plate. Now you are designing this well, right? Based on the capacity of the plate. So actually you have more than one mechanism to transfer the force, the tension force, from the flange of the beam to the whip of the column. So you're gonna pick here the lowest strength that you're gonna have for all of these capacity points. So it gives you here four items. It says A is gonna be the strength of the plate. Number two, the shear strength for the same plate. Because you just think about it this way. You say, let's say maximum tension that you can apply here on this face and this plate is gonna be able to take, let's say 100 pips. But the shear strength of the plate throughout here, right from this point to that point, let's say 80 caps. What force should I design? Should I design this well for? So if you think about it to be 100 caps, you're going to say, but the plate itself is not going to be able to transfer this force. So when you transfer the force from the beam to the web of the column, it's going to be going through more than one element, right? And each one of these elements, you're not gonna design for the actual force that goes through there, but instead you're gonna be designed for the capacity of that member. This is the reason that you're gonna be taking the weak link and designed for it, because your actual designing pays on the strength. So it says here's gonna be the shear of the plate, the shear capacity of the plate. So the first one's gonna be the capacity of the plate shear capacity of the plate. And then it says here panel zone shear strength. And this is gonna be in Step 11, which is this upcoming, plus this phi times MPE divided by D minus TBF. I'm trying to understand what is that is. And actually, this is going to be the mechanism force acting on this section. The force coming like this from the beam when this plastic hinge is going to start to occur. So we call this the mechanism tension force. It's going to be based on the mechanism, right? Based on the trends of the strength of this section, right? And I'm gonna be going through this in a minute from now. I'd like to explain this a little bit more. Now, the minimum thickness that you'd like to use here for the weld is gonna be given by this equation. It says here, this gonna be the R, C, T, C, W. What is this? Which is the smallest value of all of these four items? This gonna be one, two, three, four. You take the smallest and then you divide by two because you're gonna have two weld sides of the plate. 
And then it says here, divide by 1.39. I guess we are aware of this, right? The 1.392, which is K per inch per number of ticks of an inch. So this D actually is not gonna be the thickness, it's gonna be number of ticks of an inch. And then you subtract this section here, which means DC minus two DCF, which means I'm looking for the distance from here to there, because give me the width connection and this will thickness. This is what I'm trying to design. So, okay, good. Now let me figure out what is that force. If you remember, I was talking about this force here. What happens? What is this force here? You say, look at this column here. Here's a column. It goes from the top to the bottom, right? Let me give me a second. I would rather have it in the PowerPoint. Here's a column and here's the beam. I know someone here is going to say aspect ratio doesn't make sense because this is going to be one half of the story above, one half of the story below. So let's say this height is roughly about 14 feet. Right in a given building. Depth of the beam, let's say, is going to be 24 inches, so two feet. So the aspect ratio here or the scale is not really good, right? When you compare this edge to DB, this give you the depth of the beam, right? So at the time of mechanism, you're trying to find here when you have this M phase and M phase acting on this column. So I have this column, if you like, I can just draw it this way. I'm gonna say, you know what? This column is gonna be like this. Here's the column, right? I'm gonna come here at this point and apply MP MF like this. It's gonna be coming this way. Another MF is gonna be coming this way. Like the way that you're looking here, right? I have two forces here. I'm gonna say, in a case like this, I'm gonna have a support top and bottom. And I'm assuming here the hinge is gonna be happening at the mid height of the column. Why? Because if you look at any moment diagram in a moment frame, you're gonna see here moment at the bottom of the column and moment at the top of the column. Again, moment at the bottom of the column, moment at the top of the column. And the point of zero moment is gonna be very close to the mid height of the column. Understand that. So in a case like this, I'm gonna say, this is gonna be like my hinge. And in that case, this is gonna be my reaction and the support. Now, since this is gonna be our beam running like this, my concern is gonna be about this amount of force that we're gonna be putting on the beam flange that I'm trying here to transfer through the continuity plate. So this is actually the force that's gonna be going through the continuity plate when the force at the face of support at the face of column is gonna be equal to M sub F that we call it to be our demand. And this R demand here is gonna be based on the plastic hinge. When the plastic hinge forms, we're gonna be developing this MF at the face of the column. Okay. Maybe what I can do here is try to draw the shear diagram. First, how would you find out VC? You can say, if you really wanna find out VC, you can just take the moment about the point here. You can take the moment about the base. First, you need to find this F sub F and F sub F. F at the face due to this M sub F. If you take these two moments, divide by the distance between the center of the flange to center of the flange, right? Look at this point here, because the force is gonna be right at the mid height of the flange, right? This give you center of the flange to center of the flange. I'm gonna call this DP. And this force is gonna be equal to MF plus MF divided by DP. How big is this DP? You can say DP is gonna be equal to the beam depth subtracting the flange thickness. Why is the flange thickness? Because you have, have here one half of the flange thickness at the top and one half of the flange thickness at the bottom. And go here to the next page to look at it and how the calculations is made. Say, taken here from our book, it says DP is gonna be equal to the depth of the column, right? Subtracting TCF. And for me, it doesn't make sense because it should be related to the beam. 
And when we do the example, when we solve the example, we're gonna say that this here refers to T beam. So actually this one also is gonna be D of the beam, depth of the beam. So I'm gonna say this gonna be also depth of the beam. Depth of the beam, not depth of the column, because look at this. We're talking here about the beam, right? This is gonna be depth of the beam, subtracting one thickness of the beam flange. This should be like that. And we have M sub F. We calculated out already M sub F when we compared it with the capacity of the original beam. This R sub U, which is the force acting on the flange, this gonna be the force going through the continuity plate. It's gonna be equal to summation of MF. In a case like this, it's gonna be MF plus MF if the two beams have the same cross-section or the same beam size. If you have an end condition, like you have only one beam on the right and you don't have any beams on the left. In this case, give you only one MF. So the case that control your designs give you two times MF, which means this one, divided by DP. Now look at the shear strength. Here's the panel zone shear strength. This is gonna be the third item. If I may go back here, it's gonna be from step number 11. This is gonna be this one here. You see this one here? The panel zone shear strength. Now let's look here at the panel zone shear strength. It's gonna be given by this equation. It's gonna be phi RV, it's gonna be equal to 0.6 times the phi factor, which is one. FYC, DC, TW, and then you have these factors that you can just solve for. So this R sub U or F sub F and phi RV, is gonna be the two values that you need to consider in here. This value here, phi times MPE divided by DB minus TBF. This actually is gonna be the force that you develop here based on the mechanism. So this force is gonna be based on the mechanism of the beam, right? And this is gonna be the shear strength of the panel zone. So if you look at all of these values, the four values, actually are looking at strength of four different elements. The first one is gonna be the continuity plate in tension. Second one is gonna be the shear strength of the continuity plate. The third one is gonna be the panel zone strength. The last one is gonna be based on the mechanism of the hinge. Because someone can argue and say, well, let's say that you put very thick plate for the continuity plate. So in this case, this force is gonna be very high. And this force also is gonna be very high. And the panel zone shear strength is gonna be extremely high because now you made the panel zone very strong. So in a case like this, why should I just design for the mechanism force or the mechanism force coming from the beam to the column? Answer is yes. Would this make sense? I said, okay, yeah, it makes absolute sense. Now, do we really need to have Doppler plate or not? What is Doppler plate? If you look here at my elevation, at this detail and this elevation, if the whip of the column is not really strong enough, we may be able or we may have to add a plate and weld this plate to the web of the column. Look at what happened here. This gave be the web. We put this plate first and then we put the continuity plate on the top of it. So this gave be within the continuity plate. If you look at this detail, look at what happened. Here's the Doppler plate and then continuity plate is gonna be welded to it, which means it's gonna be going through and this plate is gonna be stopped at the face of this Doppler plate. The question is, do we really need it? I mean, do you really need this Doppler plate that says here it's needed? So what you need to do, you're gonna be doing a check and see what is the web thickness needed for the comp. All right, let's say that you need half an inch or you need three quarter of an inch. The column that you're using here, it has a web thickness of let's say five eight. And how much you need, based on your equations, is gonna be three quarter. The difference between the two, you can compensate it by adding a Doppler plate. If I may throw here some numbers, some other numbers. I'm gonna say T needed, I'm gonna say equals 0.75 inches. Whip of the column, T I usually is equal to CW of web, based on my choice, was equal to half an inch. 
So someone's going to say here, I need Doppler plate. What thickness of Doppler plate? You say it's going to be equal to the difference because at the end, you need to satisfy this needed thickness. You need three quarter and you provide only half an inch from the column. So the remainder, you can put quarter inch plate. But you may think about it and say, quarter inch plate, this is going to be nothing, right? I'm going to be adding at least half an inch plate. So in a case like this, you do Doppler plate, is going to be only from one side, and this is going to be half an inch thick. And this is what you need to provide. How do you figure out the needed thickness? I'm going to say, let's look here at this case. Doppler plate. How do you come up with the Doppler plate thickness? Look at this equation here for dependent zone strength. It says here D sub C times TW. This TW is going to be actually is going to be for the width of the column and the Doppler plate if you are planning to use in. So actually at the beginning, this TW you'd assume is going to be U redundant. It, this is going to be like, like the value that you don't know yet. Someone can assume it to be this way. Someone's going to say, well, this is going to be my unknown. And this also is going to be my unknown. Or someone else may just take these two values, right? The value of this TW, he just takes it to be the same as the column width thickness. And look for this VRV. If he's good, he's done. So it depends on the way that you'd like to solve the, the problem. If you like to set this PRV to the shear demand and solve for TW, and then compare it to the column width thickness, this is going to be also okay. So it's going to be up to you. And look at this definition for TW. TW is going to be equal to the thickness of the column width plus thickness of Doppler plate. Like in my numerical example, that the one I just threw there, the three quarter of an inch is going to be the total T needed, TW. TCW, this is going to be half an inch, which of the column, whip itself. And the rest of it is going to be the Doppler plate thickness needed. So with that, now we have the Doppler plate thickness. Step number 11, you need to be sure that you have a strong column weak beam. What does it mean by that? Usually the same buildings would like the column to be stronger than a beam. In bridges, we'd like to see a strong beam weak column. This applies here to concrete and steel, to any structural member, whether it's gonna be concrete or steel, we do the same thing. To be sure that the column is really stronger than the beam, you need to be able to satisfy this equation here. So what does it say here say? What does it say? It says summation of the plastic moment of all columns come to the same joint. So in the standard case, you're gonna have two columns and two beams, right? When you have multi-story moment frame, you have more than one bay, you're gonna have here two moment beams, moment frame beams, and two moment frame columns. In a case like this, you're gonna be adding the total trends of all columns above and below the connection. You divide this by summation of the all, the plastic moment, if you like, or the capacity moment, if you want to call it this way, of the beams right and left of the joint. And you see here the ratio between them, and it needs to be more than one. In a case like this, you're gonna have a stronger column, when you compare it to the beam strength. But someone's gonna say here, usually columns get be loaded and you're gonna have good amount of load coming to it, right? Like it's gonna be axially loaded. And we understand that once you start to hear an axial load on a column, the flexural trends of it is gonna reduce, which means this MPC, the plastic moment of the column, is gonna reduce once you start to add here an axial load. And this is true, this is correct. And the could say is, yeah, the axial load on the column must be taken into account. So this axial load, when determining the flexural strength of the column, which means when determining this MPC, you need to reduce it a little bit if you have good axial load on the column. So this MPC is gonna be reduced column strength based on the amount of axial load that it is resisting. Then they give you here a couple of equations. How do you do MPC? How do you do M for the column? And how do you do it for the beam? To give you some equations for it. Now, do you really need to have lateral bracing of the column right at the plastic hinge? Not at the plastic hinge, it's gonna be at the panel zone. You can see where at, I'm gonna see at this location. You say most likely you're gonna have a beam running perpendicular here to the slide, right? You're gonna have a structure beam coming this way, another beam from there. 
So cool. this is going to be a good bracing for the column. How much force this beam is going to be supporting? I'm going to say it's going to be supporting 2% of Fy of the beam, beam flange, thickness of the flange. So actually, if you look here at this equation here, you can do lateral bracing with the column because what happened here of the moment frame is going to start to buckle or it's going to start to sway right and left. You need to have a beam to brace it. And this beam is going to be supporting this lateral force acting on that beam perpendicular to the moment frame. How about lateral bracing? Do you need to have lateral bracing for the beam itself throughout the beam? I'm going to say yes. At what distance? If you recall, when we were looking here at the moment frame plan, and then I say it's giving maybe about four feet. And if you like to figure out this, the length of the bracing or unbraced length between a support to the bottom flange to another support to the bottom flange, provided that the top flange of the beam is completely supported by the metal deck and the concrete, right? And the Nelson studs. In a case like this, the length of unsupported, which means the length from a brace to a brace, can be given by this equation here. It's going to be all based on the beam strength. If the beam is really strong, when come to the yield strength and R sub Y, right, which is raised to gyration here, when this here becomes large, this distance between a brace to a brace is going to be larger. Standard usually that we take is going to be maybe uh, four feet, four feet, maybe five feet max. It says here a constant times R sub Y for the beam E divided by F sub Y. Um, now, how about the brace itself? How much you design the brace for? As it says here, you design usually for it's going to be 2%. You take the vertical or the force that's going to be in the beam flange, and then you take 2% of it. I guess I'm going to stop at this point here and try to go to our uh, slide set for the solved example. And this should be able to help us a lot now at this point. Any questions? No questions? All right. So here at this solved exam. We have uh, some information provided to us. I wouldn't worry much about the code. Uh, the purpose of this introduction here SS and S1, and just figure out the size of this here to be able to come up with the beam size. Uh, whenever it comes to the ACE 7, if this gonna be 2005, 10, or 16, it doesn't matter. All what I'm looking for is gonna be just, and our factor is the same. But what I care about is gonna be the phase here, which is there is no big change here from 2005 to 2016 when it comes to the phase share calculations. Uh, it could be the difference for the size and parameters, but here we don't really care about size and parameters. I just care more about the amount of force that I design my moment frame for. For the building itself, it says that you have here eight bays by eight bays. So have here nine columns by nine columns. Center line span is going to be 28 feet, and this goes to both directions. So the column spacing here is going to be 28 feet. You have five story structure above. There is no pavement, so you have the foundation at the grade level, no mezzanine, no penthouse. This is going to be a simple building with this moon frame system. The typical floor height, it says 15 feet, and it's only at the first floor, it's going to be 16 feet. So first floor is going to be 16, after it's going to be 15, all the way to the roof. I have here four bay moment frame. So within this eight bays, I have half of them, you're going to have here four bay moment frame. So the moment frame itself is going to have four bays, five columns, if this makes sense. And you have this in all sides. So you have here four sides of the building, at which you're going to have this four moment frames. Nothing in the middle. No moment frame is going to be in the middle. So now distribution of the force is going to be very simple because you're going to have here half of the force goes to each side of the building. Now let's look here at the loading. Somehow we are able to find out uniform load. 
as it says here, ultimate load is gonna be two k per foot, and this gonna be based on this given load combination. I don't really care how much was the dead load, how much was the life load. Well, what I care with this load combination here, 1.2 dead plus 0.5 life load, and this could be the one that I use with seismic loads, is going to be equal to 2k per foot. This is what I care about. Simple number. Send the span here is going to be equal to how much? How much was the span? Anyone remembers? 28 feet. You can see here, if I take here 1.2 V dead load plus 0.5 V life load, it's going to be equal to 28 caps. Just calculate it out for me. I said, great. So the demand based on the gravity and based on the size is not really critical. What I care about is the member design and the moon frame design. They give me here a beam. They say, here's a beam size that you're going to be using. 36 by 288, grade 50. A992, with R sub Y is gonna be 1.1. And the column is gonna be 36 by 395. Just you know, when it comes to an actual design, this kind of like real big members. In an actual design, we don't do that. We use much smaller members than this. But this is just an example. So let's say you have a given here beam and a given column. And the first step is to come up with the RBS parameters. So here's the beam information, depth of the beam, flange width, TBF, flange thickness, flange width, and the thickness of the flange for the beam and the web, ZXP is going to be for the main beam before you put the RBS, and the RBY, and the moment of inertia, and the same for the comp. You can just look it up easily. Just look up the information, put all the information or data, from the table of properties for the W sections. Now we said, how about the plastic hinge, the RBS? All right, let's come up with the RBS parameters. I have three values here, A, B, and C. A is giving the location, the starting location of the RBS from the face of the column. It says it should be ranging from this value to that value. You see here, I'm picking here, you need to pick a nice number. It says it's giving between 8.3 to 12 and a half. You pick 10 inches. Don't go 10 and a quarter. Just make it a simple number. Nine inches, 10 inches. So here it says, let's just go here with 10 inches. You can try and make it eight inches. Nothing wrong with that. Excuse me, like nine inches. You don't want to go below 8.3. So if you go here nine inches, nothing's wrong. Your design will still be okay. Look also at the range for B. Range for B, it says from 24.1 to 31 and a half. This says here, let's go in the middle, 28. If you decide to go 26, it's gonna be okay. If you wanna go with 30 inches, it should be also okay. I mean, nothing is wrong with that. And then he assumed here that he'd like to go to 45% reduction in the flange area. So once you do this, it means that you're gonna be taking this C times two is gonna be equal to 45% of the beam flange width. Your max is gonna be actually half, 50%. So as it says here, it's gonna be 3.75. Your actual max is gonna be 0.5. So you should go a little bit higher than this. So he decided to go here with three and three quarter, 3.75. And this is gonna be equal to 0 0.22, 22%. So you're gonna be still within half of the flange to be completely taken out. One quarter from each side, right? When I say here half of the flange, it means two times C. In our case here, we're still gonna be okay. So it should be fine. Now, this could be the RBS diameters, the parameters. And with that, you should be able to figure out the radius for this RBS and whatever value that you come up with, it doesn't matter. So let's say this gonna be 28 and quarter, I'm gonna be okay with it. What's really important is give you these parameters. It's how do you come up with them, right? You need to have some good numbers like 10, as you see here, 28, and the C needs to be, let's say three and three quarter because this is gonna be very sensitive. This 10 inch, as you see here, that you have, you have a good range. So you can go 10, you can go 11, you can go nine inches, but this one here, you got to be careful. This why you're gonna see a fraction like three and three quarter. You don't wanna go here four inches. 
All right. So now you have all the parameters for the RBS. Next, you need to find out the center to center based on your choice. You decide here that the center, center span, which is 28, you decide on the parameters for the RBS. So I said, fine. Let's figure out this clear distance for center to center from the plastic hinge to the plastic hinge is gonna be L prime. So, okay. L sub zero, when you look at L sub zero, is gonna be 28 feet. L sub H is gonna be equal to one of the half, one half of the column depth plus A or 10 inches plus this B, which is the length of the plastic hinge, 28 inches divided by two. Now the column depth here for W36 was equal to 38.4. We're gonna take half of it. So actually from the center of the column to the center of the plastic hinge, you're gonna have 43.2 inches. Now don't forget that when you do here L prime, you need to divide this by 12 times two because you have one SH from both sides. Now the distance from center of the hinge to center of the hinge now becomes 20.8. Now, to work on this mechanism shear, you need to find out the plastic section modulus of the RBS of the reduced section. Now you have the ZXB for the beam itself. If I may go back a couple of slides, it's gonna be this ZXB. This is for the main beam. Before you do the cut, it's gonna be 1190 inch cube. You're gonna be taking this value here and then you're gonna start to reduce it by these parameters by the cut in the flange. With that, you get reduced from 1190 to 771.6. As you see here, this gave a big reduction here, right? This CPR, which is gonna account for the strain hardening based on this given material information, is gonna be 1.15, which is very standard. As long as it's gonna be within 1.2, I'm gonna be using this 1.15. If you remember R sub Y that accounts for the test versus a specified yield trends is usually gonna be 1.1 for this type of steel. So we can say how much here, the maximum moment that you can develop at this plastic hinge. You can say MPR, probable moment, maximum moment that you can ever develop at this plastic hinge location is gonna be equal to F sub Y, yield trends, it's gonna be the 50 K sign, times ZE, which is Z of the RBS, here it is, times 50, times 1.1 for the R sub Y times CPR of 115. Now your maximum moment that you can develop at this plastic hinge at the RBS is gonna be 84, excuse me, 48,829 kPa. Now this gonna be your maximum moment. If you take the two times this value here, y by L prime is gonna give you here the mechanism share. So exactly what's gonna happen. This mechanism shear is gonna be equal to two MPR divided by L prime. And don't forget that you have some gravity load that you need to add to it. Gravity load needs to be accounted from the center of the plastic hinge to the center of the plastic hinge. But when it comes to S sub H, you can ignore it because the length of this S sub H is gonna be really small. It's not really critical. Here's VPR, two times the 48 M fraction, MPR, keep inch. You divide this by L prime. 20.8. Now, if this is gonna be in kip inch, be sure that this also is gonna be in inches. So if you like, you can have your MPR kip foot or kip inch, but be careful because this length needs to be matching the same units that you use here in the moment. Now we have mechanism shear is gonna be 391. This is gonna be the shear that you can develop in the beam. When the beam is gonna start to hinge. So once the beam here is gonna to start to hinge, it's gonna be the maximum shear that you can ever develop in this beam. Via the RBS, now you need to add this component, which is coming from the gravity loads. Look at this shear, 28, compared to 391. Now I guess you understand that even for the beam itself, it's not really a big deal, 28 compared to 391. Now think about what happened here for a sub edge. It's gonna be really small. Now this is gonna be V of the RBS and we're gonna be using 419 caps and this is gonna be the one controls our design as it says here. So now we have the shear at the RBS. So, okay, good. Now we need to figure out the moment at the face. 
of the column. If you want to do here the moment at the face of the column, you take NPR, which is the moment come from here, this moment, plus mechanism shear multiplied by this S sub H. Now, this is going to be the new definition for S sub H. It's going to be to the face of the column. And if the gravity load from here to there is going to be very small, you can ignore it. But if you decide to add them, just go ahead and add them. It's not a big deal. Here is the moment at the face of support, moment at the face of calm. It's going to be equal to NPR, the 48,000 and fraction, plus V of the RBS, the 419 caps, applied by our S sub H. Now, our S sub H here is going to be to the face of the column, which means it's going to be equal to what? If I may go back here. B over 2 plus A. If you remember, that was equal to 10 inch, and B was equal to how much? Can someone remind me, please? 28. 28, thank you. To 28 divided by 2 plus 10. 28 divided by 2 plus 10. It's right there. Apply by this V of the RBS. Now I have 58. If you try the other side with the lower value of the shear, of course you're going to end up with lower value, right? Of M sub F prime at the other side of the beam. So I'm going to be staying with this value here. 58, 885, keep inch. Is giving the moment at the face. And for that, this is now is going to be our demand at the section of the beam that you like to keep it as elastic within this A. We'd like to keep this elastic. We don't want this to hinge. So I want to be sure that this moment here is going to be lower than the capacity of that beam section, which is the plastic moment of the section. If you like to check here the gravity moment, you should be able to do it. Look at this one half. WL squared, and this gives you the moment for a small cantilever, which is this sub H cantilever. Why do I assume this cantilever? Because at the end of it, you are going to have a hinge. So, this is the reason that you assume to be a cantilever. And look at this moment here, it's going to be 48 kip inch. Compare now 48 kip inch with 58,000, it's almost nothing. So, if you have a spreadsheet and you just decide here to include this within this, I mean, this is fine, just add them up together. Nothing's wrong with that. But code says that you should be able to ignore it. So it doesn't hurt. If you want to add it, go ahead and add it. It's going to increase your demand a little bit. Not a big deal. How about the capacity here? Capacity of the beam section that you wanted to keep elastic is going to be equal to R sub Y, the 1.1, multiplied by the original beam plastic modulus which is this 1190, this before you do the cut, multiply by 50 K sign. And look at this, you have 65, 450 kip inch as your capacity because your fee factor is getting equal to one. So this is good. You have demand of 58 and fraction, let's say about 59,000 and your capacity is getting 65,000 and fraction. So this is good, you're getting lower than one. Look at this factor here. Now let's do the ratio, demand to capacity. This gives you demand, right? And it's giving the capacity. Demand to capacity ratio is giving 0.9, which is perfect. This is actually a very good design for this choice. Let's say that you'd like to increase this value here, right? 0.9. How can I increase this value? How can I make it 0.95? Is this something good? I'm guessing no. How can you increase it? How can you reduce it? How can you play with this factor here? I'd like you to think about the factors I've used to develop this ratio, demand to capacity ratio. Can I say the beam section is going to be the same as the beam section? So this phi MPE is going to be constant. You cannot really change it unless you change the beam size. But I'm talking about for the same beam size. How can I play with this factor? You say the whole thing here is going to be based on this MF. How can I reduce MF? How can I increase MF? What are the factors going to be pushing MF to go higher? What are the factors that I can use and work with to bring this MF down? Say, so let's look here at numbers. MF is going to be equal to NPR. When you do bigger cut, when this C is going to be larger, right? When you cut more from the flange, this number is going to reduce. Right? You see, yeah, it's clear. How about V of the RBS? You see, it depends on the spacing. It depends on this. NPR depends on the spacing, L prime. 
When you increase this L prime, this VRBS is going to reduce. Meaning when you reduce the factor A, when this A is going to be reduced, when you push this this way, when you put the plastic hinge to the left a little bit, the V at the RBS is going to reduce because the mechanism shear is going to reduce. So cutting the flanges, move this section a little bit this way by reducing A and B is going to help you out a little bit to reduce this MF. Does this make sense? Because look at this, it's going to be A and this is going to be B over two. But you don't want to squeeze it. You don't want to go lower than the limits provided to you. Otherwise, you can see here's good damage in the plastic hinge during an earthquake. If you make this very small, this is going to be really damaged. You don't want to see this. And if you bring A below the limit, let's say that you make this A to be six inches. So what does it mean by that? It means that the plastic hinge is going to be hitting this section here. Because when the plastic hinge is going here, it's going to form, buckling is going to happen to the flanges. And when the flange is going to buckle, it's going to also buckle this section. So actually you're shifting the plastic hinge. Now is the plastic hinge is going to be touching the column flange and the wood is going to get fractured. So you don't want to do this. So it's kind of, you need to balance it. You don't want to push this hinge all the way to the left. And you don't want also to bring it to the center of the beam. Otherwise the shear demand is going to be very high. Just imagine if this 10 inches, you made it like two feet, what's going to happen? V of the RBS is going to be jumping high because now this becomes like two feet. And this SH is going to be large. So MF is going to be really growing up. You don't want this to happen. So you need to balance your design. This is the reason that they give you here a range. If you look here at the range, just to recall this range, we have a range here for A, B, and C, right? We have a range. This range is given so that you can balance your design. You don't put the hinge to happen at the face of the support. At the same time, also, you'd like to control MF to V M P of the beam. Questions? Are good? Is it okay? Great. So this is good. So with this step here, what did we confirm? We confirmed that the plastic hinge is going to be happening at the RBS. And the plastic hinge is not going to be pushed at the face of support. So we protected here the weld. Again, we confirmed by this step, step number six and number seven. We confirmed that this section is going to stay elastic and the plastic hinge is going to be formed at this location. So up to this step here, we control the location of the plastic hinge. And we confirm this is going to be really happening there. When it comes to controlling something in the structure analysis, in the structure business, or the structure performance of a member, you control it by the way you detail it and by selection of the material properties. Let's say that you decide to have a hinge for a simply supported beam. You'd like to do a simply supported beam. You need to detail the hinge to be a real hinge. Otherwise, this hinge will never form. If you want it to be fixed, you need to detail it. When you do the structure design, you need to detail it to be fixed. If you don't do this detail to be able to withstand this strength or this demand that you have on it, you cannot really call it fixed. So actually what we do here, we detail the structure to perform in the desired way. And this is exactly what we are doing here. And you can apply this concept to lots of the other designs. We detail this RBS so that this is gonna be a plastic hinge during an earthquake. And that the plastic hinge will never touch the interface to the column. So this weld is protected because it's gonna be in the elastic range. And we have here a factor of 0.9, demand to capacity ratio in that section. So we know that plastic hinge will never form here. It's gonna be only formed right at this location. Okay, now shear check and shear design. In the shear check, we need to figure out this VRBS and we have done this already. A few steps back, we have done this V of the RBS and we have used it. Here's the V of the RBS. We say it's gonna be 419 caps. Yeah, we have done this already. So I said, okay, let's use here this V of the RBS. Here's V of the RBS, 419. 
Same step that we have done before. Now we need to check the beam. We're going to be sure that the beam is going to be able to take the shear because this is going to be the maximum shear that happens in the beam, right? Based on this mechanism. So we want to confirm that the beam itself is going to be able to take the shear by its web. How can we do this? We're going to say, okay, here's the check for the compactness. DB divided by T. BW, which means a beam width. Once you do here, because you have this information, you have the depth of the beam, you have the width thickness, it's giving you 41.5. Compactness limit or stability limit for the beam width is going to be equal to 245, is root of E divided by F sub Y, which is equal to 59. So this factor here, which is the actual aspect ratio of the beam width, turn to be lower than this value, then this is good. I'm going to say yes, compactness or stability of the web has been confirmed. In this case, I can say that Vn, which is the capacity of the web, is going to be equal to 6% of Fy. And this is like the standard. Whenever you do any shear design or shear trends for any structure member, you need to take the shear area multiplied by 6% of F sub y. And your C sub V is going to be equal to 1, 1.0, times a web and a web is going to be the depth of the beam multiplied by the thickness of the beam web. And with that, you have 985 kips. This is excellent. So the beam here is going to be able to take up to 985 kips. And look at this. The maximum shear that you can develop when you start to form the hinge is going to be 419. So we know for sure that this beam is not going to be fading in shear. This is going to be the second important thing that we are able to confirm with our design. So number one, plastic hinge is going to be happening at the RBS location right at the center. Number two, the section of the beam which is outside of the RBS right at the interface of the column is in the elastic range, right? We are able here to control location of the plastic hinge within the RBS. Number three, the beam itself is able to take this shear demand, and the shear demand in this case is gonna be the maximum shear that you can ever develop in the beam. It's gonna be equal to the mechanism shear plus the gravity shear that goes with it. You see here 419 versus 985, I'm gonna say this is excellent. This beam is in good shape now. Why? Because we confirmed plastic hinge location. We confirmed that the rest of the beam is gonna be in the elastic range. We confirmed that the beam is gonna be able to take the shear strength, so shear demand. Uh, any questions? You're good? Because you need to get ready. You're going to have your uh, your homework or your project for the beam design is going to be there very soon. I assigned here one homework that is going to be really important for you guys. Have you guys seen it? Yes? No? Yeah, yes. I looked over it a little bit. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, I'm gonna stop here at this point and I'd like to share with you your homework. It's gonna be very similar to what you guys have seen in your uh, midterm too, right? Okay, great. Difference is uh, in the left column, you're gonna have one MP here and one MP here, correct? Two MP. And here, you're gonna have only one MP on the top. Now, which state is going to be larger of the first column or second column? Are you speaking, Mark? Second column? The second column, you're going to have larger theta, right? And then you have two different columns. So 2MP for this is going to be completely different from MP of that. Actually, this problem here was in the final uh, exam for the last uh, for the last 530 of course you should expect something a little bit different than this right but you understand the concept so I want to be sure that we cover this issue now you have seen a few good examples in the slide sets and also you have seen it in the midterm and then you have seen it also as a homework and expect a little bit complex more frame than this. I mean, I need to do a change, right? Because now you have seen this, you have seen the other one in your midterm, and then you have seen that one 
if I may go back here, you can say in this plastic moment, you have seen this example here, right? How can I make a problem like this? How can I take this and make it a little bit complex? Maybe do a column is going to be different from the other column in the size. Maybe do one of the columns going to be short. Change the boundary conditions. So I want you to train yourself on this for the final. I don't want it to be a surprise or you're going to be confused. Now, you have seen all types of different moment frames. You have seen here hinge, hinge. Right, same column, different column. You have seen different height, hinged, hinged. You have seen hinged fixed, different columns, right? Look at this. What's the difference between this and this? All the same, right? Isn't it? Two different columns, different heights. Both of them is gonna be hinged. Here, I just changed one of them, I made it fixed, which means that you're gonna have additional MP at the base, right? And then you are in here, two story. So what's the next step? How can I make it a little bit more complex? So it's different. Maybe change the column height. Two different columns. All righty. Any questions? This is just that one problem or because I want to scroll down, there was some solutions for it some other stuff. Yes. Um, no, have. Yeah, I don't know. Have. Yeah, let me stop this.